Thank you, thank you for your time. I appreciate it very much. This is all part of our uh, process of uh, visiting with uh, the voters throughout the state, the, the people of the state, on our recommendations to turn our state around. Uh, we're doing it now because we have a unique window in time here this spring uh, to try to make some big changes. You all know that change is very difficult. Um, changing the structure of any organization is hard. Um, we're trying to change the structure of Illinois government, make it more responsive to the voters and the taxpayers, um, and less, less controlled by insiders to the government. And doing that is difficult. Uh, but the fact that the state is in crisis and the city of Chicago is in financial crisis creates a, a, an opportunity. And the timing is propitious in, in that regard. So um, we are trying to advocate an aggressive turnaround agenda right now this spring for this legislative session. And our recommended changes have already been um, um, put into legislative form in, in conjunction with the Republican caucus. Uh, in the General Assembly, and uh, and those those bills are ready to be discussed with the Democratic Caucus uh, at, as 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 the process uh, unfolds here now. Uh, quick background: um, I'm relatively pleased the way things have gone overall uh, since the election. Uh, worked hard to get to know all the members of the General Assembly. I can't say as I know 100 percent yet, but I'm pretty pretty close. Um, I've spent one-on-one -on -one time with members. I've uh, since, since coming into office and moving into the governor's residence here, um, a, a, almost every day that the General Assembly is in session, we've invited a group of legislators over to have breakfast uh, with me uh, or dinner, uh, and, and dinner, frankly. It's breakfast and dinner most every day. Anywhere from four legislators to as many as a dozen. It's, it's generally a half a dozen. Uh, and they've been great discussions. I've enjoyed it. My sense is the legislators have enjoyed it. Um, good chance to get to know each other. Um, we've had some good arguments. Uh, we've had some good agreements <laughs> for Democrats and Republicans. And uh, I've really, uh, you know what, they're, I'm, I'm just very pleased. They're good people. I've really enjoyed um, uh, the, the significant majority of the folks I really like, I personally like a lot, um, and uh, Democrats and Republicans. And uh, I've also worked hard. Um, to get to know the leaders well. So I've, 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 I've known Leader Durkin and Leader Rodonio for some time, and I've worked with them in the past. We have a good, good friendship and good communication. Um, and uh, I've known Speaker Madigan for a number of years uh, through various circles, um, but I've worked hard since the election to spend time with the Speaker and with the President. Uh, I've had dinner with uh, Mike and Shirley and Diana and me, and with Pam and John. Uh, we've gotten to know each other. I'm very fond of them. I love their spouses. Sometimes I wish their spouses were in office instead of them, but you know, that's a different, <laughs> it's a different subject. Um, but um, they're, uh, they're great, and we have a good, cordial uh, working relationship. We have good communication. I speak uh, to the leaders you know, on a not infrequent basis by phone, uh, and we meet. I go, I've gone to um, the president's office on a number of occasions. Uh, the Speaker and the President have come to my office on a number of occasions. Uh, we talk by phone fairly often. And I feel like we have a good work relationship. And people tell me that they, 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 they have found this to be very refreshing. They have not had this kind of a relationship with a governor uh, in the past, which is good. I mean, I, that's a plus. Because if we're going to help improve our state, it's going to be on a bipartisan basis. And uh, every, anything we do, is going to be bipartisan. So, uh, and, and my attitude is I work for everybody in the state, and anybody who's an elected official who's working on behalf of the families of Illinois is my partner. And I work with anybody who has a good heart and a good intention to try to do the right thing. We may disagree on tactics sometimes, but we have the same goals. Rising family incomes, great career opportunities, uh, value for the tax dollar, um, excellent schools, excellent education. Um, and, uh, and elimination as much as possible of corruption and conflict of interest in the government. We all share those goals, I believe. And uh, we, may, we may have slightly different techniques on how to get, achieve those goals, but we agree. I think we're going to agree far, far more than we disagree. And I've specifically asked members of the legislature for their ideas on priorities. What are their legislative priorities, personally and for their caucus? And I've listened, I've heard a number of ideas, because I've been eager to hear, in case there was going to be something big that, in my view, would be just a complete non-starter, 
I'd rather talk about it early because I don't like to surprise people. And uh, I have not heard a complete non-starter from anybody. And as I've laid out our agenda, and I've tried right from day one, we've laid out our agenda. I've been eager for feedback. And people have expressed concern, but nobody has said to me, boy, this is a complete non-starter. Um, and, and so, you know, we're just now, now what will happen through the votes in May? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, you know. The process will unfold. The process to fix the 2015 budget hole um, took longer than, than uh, I anticipated um, and that, frankly, some, some legislators anticipated. Uh, but the, the wheels of democracy grind uh, slowly, and it's a little bit of, you know, watching sausage get made. I mean, it's not, not pretty, um, but uh, hopefully it tastes good at the end. And uh, I would say the 2015 bill, in the end, was, it was a bipartisan compromise. There, frankly, there are things in there that I absolutely dislike. Um, but there are things in there that I think everybody involved in the process dislikes. And the good news is we got a c cash crisis fixed without borrowing and without um, raising taxes. And to me, that was the, that was the critical goal that we, that we set uh, early on. And we did it on a bipartisan basis. And I was very gratified I, um, uh, in the sense that the feedback from the legislature uh, with our administration was very positive through the process. I think our team did a great job, and the staffs of the legislative leaders did a great job. And when I, I wanted to go into these uh, chambers after the vote, and I went into the House and went to the Senate. People were stunned, like, governors don't come in here like this. And I said, oh, if you want to kick me out, you can. I mean, I'm just coming. So I went, I went in, and I shook hands and hugged, hugged uh, folks and give high fives and, you know, said thank you and congratulations. And, you know, this is one small step in trying to improve our state on a bipartisan basis. And I think, uh, you know, I think at the moment we have a very good, positive energy and, and, and a lot of, I think, goodwill. Now, we're going to need it because we've got a lot of tough compromises. And I've told, I've told everybody in the legislature that I've been meeting with, we're going to have to take some tough votes. And, uh, and I'm going to have to sign some bills that I'd rather not sign. I mean, it's just true. Um, uh, but and I've told my my friends in the Republican caucus. I said I'm going to ask you guys to vote for some things that you are very very much against. Welcome to politics. I mean we're this is going to be bipartisan compromise. We're going to have to do some things that we don't like in order to do things that we do like, and and find a, a solution that's that, that that moves our state forward, and and in a significant way. And the folks who've said to me, well, Bruce, don't talk about, you know, conflicts of interest or government unions or stuff like that. Just focus on the budget and get it balanced. That's what a lot of people said to me. And I say, I can't balance the budget long run unless I deal with the conflicts of interest and the structural challenges inside the, uh, inside the government. And I will have failed as, as governor if all, we do, if all we do is talk about should the budget be $32 billion or $33 billion, and should we put a billion into Medicaid or a billion into schools, if that's all we talk about, we will have failed because that when I'm gone and we have another governor who's not financially disciplined as we've had, and the conflicts of interest and the power structure in the government stays in place, we will blow, we'll be blown apart again just as, as we've been. And we've got to, we've got to take the, long, the right solutions for the long term, and that means structural reform and taking the power away from the insiders in the government and giving it to the taxpayers and the voters. That's at the core of our agenda. That's what restoring the balance of power between the insiders and the government and the taxpayers and the voters. And people have said to me, well, Bruce, you know what? What we really need to do, some people have said, what we really need to do is just raise the income tax, get a, actually get a graduated income tax so that wealthier people are paying more and things will be fine. We'll have the money, um, it, it's more fair, and things will be fine. And I say, no, I, 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 I beg to disagree with you. I, things will not be fine. And you can look at a number of other states where things are not fine fiscally. And you can look at California, one of the wealthiest you know, governments in the world, and they have they can't barely fund their pensions, and they've constantly got debts and debt and deficits and and and, and loss of, of of jobs that would otherwise be there. And uh, look at Connecticut, look at New Jersey, look at New York, where the insiders in the government are dominant and powerful, constant unfunded pension liabilities, debt deficits, and fiscal uh, problems. And I like to point out New Jersey, you know, I have many friends there, um, but, and, and they've struggled, they've struggled. New Jersey's a lot like Illinois. New Jersey's a lot, it's similar population size, 
similar relatively wealthy state, losing their wealth because of mismanagement, but they've been relatively wealthy state. Uh, similar excellent strategic location within the United States. Strategically, Illinois has got a great location. Really, should we should be thriving if we were managed better. New Jersey should be thriving. They, they have a great location. New Jersey's just like us. Dominant government unions, dominant um, insider control, significant corruption, um, just like us. And, and just like us, they have extremely high property taxes. Us in New Jersey, we in New Jersey basically have the highest property taxes in America by quite a bit. Um, and they're like us. They have a very high sales tax. And they've done what people are telling me to do. They've put in a graduated income tax, a high graduated income tax. And you know what? They can't pay their pensions. They are not funding their pensions, and they got some of the highest taxes in America. They haven't dealt with the structural problem and the conflicts of interest in, with inside the government. And that's why, as I travel the state, and you'll see in, this, in, the, in, the, in the binder that we gave you, uh, I, 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 I put two quotes. I could find 50 good quotes of, of leaders, mostly Dem De uh, Democrats, who point out the challenges when, when the insiders in the government are all powerful. And I've got quotes. I quote Fra um, Franklin Roosevelt, and I, and I quote um, uh, Michael Bloomberg from New York. If you read the excerpts of Michael Bloomberg's speech that we've included there for you, if you read that speech, and you take out the words New York City and put in the words City of Chicago, you summarized our problem. You take out the words City of New York and put in the words State of Illinois, you've summarized our problem. And if you read what Franklin Roosevelt wrote, I think he was probably the most pro-union president in American history, but if you read what he wrote about government collective bargaining, you see the challenge that, that we face. And look at, you know, some people in the media have said, uh, or in some of my political opponents have said, oh, Bruce is a radical right-wing extremist. He's just, he's, out, he's unreasonable and outrageous. And I beg to differ. I say, no, I'm a pragmatic centrist is what I am. 29 states, 29 states do not allow fair share collective uh, um, uh, union dues collection in the government. This is not a radical outlier. Illinois' policy is a radical outlier. My, ad my recommendations are not. And look at what the federal government does. The federal government is not a bastion of conservatism. Look at what the federal government does around collective bargaining inside the, the federal government, and you can see. And um, the, the latest round of federal government labor um, contract um, collective bargaining rules were put in place by Democrats, a Democratic president in 1978 and a Democratic Congress. This is not a partisan issue. This is, this is a good government issue and a balance of power issue. If, the, if insiders are powerful with taxpayer money, they can control the elected officials, and there's no pushback. There's no, there's no there there on the other side, and the spending and the liabilities just balloon out of control. And you can see it everywhere that, it, everywhere that that power structure has stayed in place. You can look around in, in, the, in, the, in the cities and in the states where that, has, that structure has stayed in place. That's why I need to take that on now as part of balancing our budget and getting fiscal um, reform to the state. And I agree very much with many of my Democratic colleagues in the legislature. I'd like to put more money into social services. I believe in a strong social services safety net. We should put money into helping our veterans who are struggling to get reestablished in their lives. We should put money into helping our developmentally disabled uh, residents. We should put money into helping our low-income kids get early childhood education and be, be assisted with their uh, 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 lives. We should help our elderly citizens living in poverty and who need support. We, we should have one of the best social services programs in the nation. If we get the money out of the government bureaucracy, and we get a strong pro-growth, pro-job creation economy, we will have the money to put into our social services. And frankly, we'll probably need to put mon less money into the social services because more people will have good careers and will have the support to be able to f support themselves. But, but we can do both. It's very hard for any organization to survive well if it's hostile to, to, to uh, job creators and economic growth, which Illinois has been and uh, have a big spending on social services and big spending on government bureaucracy. That's a trifecta that is Illinois' current situation, and it's very hard to overcome. I mean, you, it, it, that's not a recipe for success. 
It's, it's, it's not. We need to become more pro-growth. That's what our agenda is about, pro-job creation. Um, and we need to shrink the government bureaucracy and put the money into the economy for growth and into our social services. And that's what our, our agenda is about. And I've told members of the General Assembly, anything's on the table for me. I'll talk about anything. But what we got to talk about is this. And we got to get this done, and I'm open to anything that you'd like to consider. I've been very gratified. You know, I've enjoyed, I've, I've, I've loved, and I, I say this all over the state. Some people up around Chicago get cranky when I say it. I've loved living in Springfield. What a great community. I love, people here are awesome. You know what, one of the most emotional times of the last two and a half years, and going into public service for the first time in my life, and the first member of my family ever to go anywhere near this. The rest of my family is like, Bruce, you are doing what? The, you know, the most emotional time, one of the most emotional times, here in Springfield, two teachers came up to me at an event uh, after I became governor. And one of them started to cry. And I, said, I, I gave her a hug and I said, what's wrong? And she said, you are healing a wound in this community that you just can't, uh, you, you don't fully appreciate. And I said, really? I, I, well, uh, God bless you. And we hugged and I was tearing up. I said, don't make me cry. I gotta go give, give a talk here in a second. What's, and, and you know what? This is a great community, and, and so much of the heart of this community has been hurt by prior leadership in our government. And, it's, and this, is, this is our state capital. We should treat it with, as the capital, and it should be treated with respect. And whether it's the governor's residence or the capital or how the government is operated and where much of the government operations is based, this is the state capital. And I, I believe that very strongly. And I'm from Lake County. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not from, I'm Lake from, you know, so I mean, this is not... I, I just, I, I, this, as a state, as a citizen of Illinois, I think that's the right thing. And so I'm, I'm honored. I'm honored to fix up the governor's residence. I'm honored to be here with the most of my time. Now that I, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not here every single day. A lot of the days I'm on the road. I mean, I, I'm a road warrior. I love to travel. We drive all over the state. I, I put a hundred and, I don't even know, 170,000 miles driving the state during the campaign. And now, like today, we drove Quincy, Beardstown, Peoria, and back. And prior to this, I, I, we drove McHenry County, Rockford, yes, McHenry County yesterday, Rockford, um, Quint, uh, uh, Rock Island, uh, Moline, Moline, and down here, driving. And I get a lot of phone work done, a lot of reading done uh, while we're driving. And we just go everywhere in the state. And I love it. People in the state are great. Uh, so far, I'm still driving. You're driving to Chicago and back? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's only a couple, you know, two and a half hours, it's, and I get a lot of phone work done, a lot of reading done. Um, one of the things, it, the other thing I've enjoyed about Springfield is, is getting to know uh, uh, employees in the government. You know, I'm trying to go into every department, labor department, revenue department, natural resources, licensing, you know, et cetera. We got a lot of departments. You guys know I have 80 direct reports? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, but I go into these departments because I want to meet people and listen to, and I, and I go in and I say, look, I'm here because I'm working for you. You do your job well, the people of Illinois are served. We have the privilege. It's not a right. It's a privilege to work for the people of Illinois. You, you and I have that privilege. And I'm here because I want to listen to you. I would like to come up with a structure where I pay you a bonus whenever you find a big way to save taxpayer money. And I'd like to pay you incentive on your productivity rather than seniority. Most people go, I like that idea. And a lot of the departments, I've had some standing ovations, which makes me, you know, makes you feel good, whether it's for whatever reason, it's okay. Um, but you know what I'm, one of the biggest surprises has been? In most of the departments I've gone into, somebody will stand up, uh, Mr. Governor, I'm honored to hear. You know what? I've worked in Illinois state government for 27 years. I've never seen a governor in my life. No governor's come to talk to us. Never seen a governor in this department. And I'm like, you're kidding me. That's terrible. I mean, we're all, we're, we're all, we're partners. We're, we have a job to do, and I'm, my job is to help you be effective in your jobs, and we should talk. And, and uh, I'm surprised. I've heard that on <laughs> more than a few occasions. Um, but I've enjoyed it, and the people are great. You know, the people I've met in the government, by and large, good people with good hearts who are there for the right reasons and just want to be helpful. That's great. I, I love that. 
And so to me, I'm very excited, I, you know, very, very energized. I very, this is the most energized I feel like I've been since I was in my 20s. And I'm very humbled and very, I feel like it's a privilege to work for the people of Illinois. Now we got a mess and I'm gonna be taking arrows. And as I told people day one, I'm gonna be Mr. Unpopularity. I won't be, or I said Mr. I won't be Mr. Popular, Mr. Popularity this year. And that's true. I'm gonna take, you know, you guys know, you guys are piling on too. It's, it's part of the, it's, you guys, it's your job. It's your job to point out fault flaws and weaknesses and failures and bad decisions. And that's, I have no problem with that. I've, to, uh, I've told members of the General Assembly, we're going to take tough decisions. And I'm perfectly fine. You, got, you as legislators take credit when things are good. Do you take the credit? I don't need to be on stage with you and put the blame on me when things are bad. I have no problem with that. And I literally, literally don't care if I'm reelected. I don't think many people say that. I say it every day. This is not, this has never been my life goal. I'm not getting paid for this. And people who say, some of my opponents say, oh, he's really, he's secretly making a lot of money out of this. He just doesn't tell you how. Let me be clear. I am losing a lot of money on doing this. But I've been fortunate. I've been blessed in my life. And this is, I believe, as the Bible says, to whom much has been given from whom much is expected. I didn't inherit any money, but I've made a lot working for teachers and government workers in this state. And I've done a great job. I'm proud of it. And this is my chance to give back. And I don't have to take a salary. And that's fine. And I can spend a lot of money in my campaign. And that's fine. But I'm doing this because I love the state. And, I'm do and I want big change. And I've told the General Assembly, to put it on me if it's bad. You take the credit if it's good. And, and, and uh, we have a good working relationship. So now I'm traveling the state getting the message out. And I'm trying to build momentum because we've got to get the General Assembly to take some tough votes. The good news is this is bipartisan. I have bipartisan support for this. And I have bipartisan opposition to this. This is not a partisan turnaround. This is a, this is, this is a bipartisan turnaround. Um, if you look at who voted for the firefighter Manning bill in November, you understand the challenge. I don't know how many of you might have studied that vote or that bill, but it, it's, well, that will educate you if you haven't studied who voted for that bill. Um, we have, uh, we have a big challenge, and I, we've got to get these, these votes done now over the next few months. So um, I'm, I'm traveling the state getting groups. I'm meeting with mayors. Mayors are the number one place. I'm meeting with, I've, I've met with, geez, dozens and dozens and dozens of mayors. Because mayors are CEOs like me. They, they, they need balanced budget. They need a strong economy. They need a reasonable tax burden. They need great schools. They got to live within their means. They've got conflicts of interest in their government. They're just, they're lined up. And well, I don't care whether they're Democrats or Republicans. They have the same issues I got. And the response for them, from the mayors has been extremely strong. Same with the county, county board members, very strong. Same with superintendents and schools, mostly very much aligned with us. Uh, meeting with the chambers of commerce, very strong. Meeting with small business owners, very strong. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased we're getting a lot of support. And our agenda boils down to four big buckets, and you, you have them there. One is pension reform. One is economic reform. One is, is taxpayer protection, and the other is government reform. So and I could, I'll tell you briefly about those, and then maybe we'll, then we'll do open it up to Q and A. So on pension reform, I've been pretty clear from the from from the get go for a long time now that I didn't didn't support the pension reform that was done that's in front of the, the courts now because I didn't feel it was fair. I didn't think it was constitutional, but I didn't think it was fair. I don't think you reduce the benefits of a retiree after they're retired. I just don't think that's right. I mean, you could, we can all fight about it, but I just I don't believe that. But I, and I also don't think it's necessary in order to fix the problem. I think what we can we can do in government what corporate America has done for decades to fix their pension problems, and that is to protect existing benefits that have been accrued, but freeze those where they are, protect them, and pay them when that person retires. But create a second pension plan for current employees for their future work. Second pension plan. So when somebody retires, they get two pensions. They get the, or when current workers retire, they get two pensions. The one, the, the benefit they've accrued so far and the benefit they've earned through their future work. Nothing unfair about it. I believe it's constitutional, but we'll, you know, we could spend years in court while that gets sorted out. Um, uh, but, it, and it's, contra it's, it's consistent with contract law, and I think it's, it's, it's consistent with moral fairness. I mean, um, nobody knows what's happening tomorrow. No, no workers have promised the government that they're going to work for the government tomorrow. And, and, uh, and no, nobody knows if they have a job tomorrow. We can all work out what the compensation is for tomorrow's work. We should not unilaterally, after the fact, reduce compensation from yesterday's work. That's just 
basic, to me, basic fairness. That's the essence of our reform recommendation. But I recommend we don't spend years in court. I recommend that we pass it as a law, but we also put it on the ballot in 2016 as a constitutional referendum and put it in the Constitution that, that we don't uh, take away historical pensions, but future pensions can be whatever we work out going forward. And I also believe we should uh, reverse um, the Supreme Court's what, a decision that I disagree with I, it's, uh, on health care. The Supreme Court decided to put health care in under the pension protection language, and I, health care is not mentioned in the Constitution. And I think that's a wrong decision. I, my recommendation is that we, as the voters of the state, make the cl Constitution clear on the issue so we don't have to spend years fighting, because we could spend many, many years in court. Even, even whatever, um, even if the Supreme Court approved my understanding from the lawyers is even if the Supreme Court approved the pension bill in, on May 22nd, when their opinion is, I think, supposed to come down, I think even then we'll spend years fighting in the courts over that pension bill. And I, I, we don't have the time. I don't think it's fair to the workers, and I don't think it's fair to the taxpayers to keep all this time in court. But that's one bucket. The other bucket is, is economic growth. Workers' comp change, real reform, not, not the small one that was done before. Unemployment insurance reform, uh, tort reform. Increase the increasing of the minimum wage and allowing local governments to decide for themselves whether they want to have uh, employment empowerment zones within their communities, municipalities and counties, um, you know, right to work zones. So, and here, here's why this is important. It's not, people say, oh, Bruce, you're anti union or you're what? I'm not. Illinois is going to be a union state for decades and decades, and I want us to compete while we stay a union state. And we can do that by having a few counties and a few cities vote to become right to work, employment flexible within their community. That gets Illinois on the list. And this is what I want your readers to understand. There's a list that relocation firms and corporate America keeps and foreign governments keep on right to work states and closed shop states. And many, there are thousands of companies that won't expand or move to a closed shop state. Now, there are thousands that will. That's great. We can go, but I want to get as big a, a growth universe as I can. I want to recruit everybody to the state, and there are thousands of companies that won't come to the to the. And I've got I'm collecting the stories of why because we've had a lot of corp businesses abused here in the in the in the process, and they that gets around. We have a reputation. We have a bad reputation on this issue. As long as we get a few counties or municipalities to vote to go that way. Then we're on the list, and then I can recruit some of those companies. And companies, let me be clear, companies want to be in Illinois. Incredibly hardworking people here. Uh, great strategic location here. Incredible natural resources here. Incredible infrastructure here, although we're letting it deteriorate, and I want to change that. I'm going to put a big infrastructure plan in place. Um, and, uh, and very fertile agriculture here. We have, we have every reason for businesses, want, and we're the heart of America. I mean, we, we have every reason to thrive. But businesses, we are at the bottom of the list on economic growth. And we lost more population last year than, than any state, and we've lost 275,000 people. And we're, we're, we are, we are, and it's our regulations and our taxes, and that's what I want to fix. On the government reform, um, it's empowering local voters to be able to get a handle on property taxes. Property taxes only increase uh, when voters do a referendum to authorize it. I believe that's good government reform. Um, it's empowering local officials and local voters to decide what gets collectively bargained within their governments. The governments, the local governments belong to the voters and the taxpayers of those communities. It doesn't belong to <laughs> and, and, and bless them. It, you know, they're, the, the teachers' union leader is a nice person, I, and, and the AFSCME leader is a nice person. Government doesn't belong to them. They don't dictate terms. They do not dictate terms. The government belongs to the voters and the taxpayers of the state. They should decide what gets collectively bargained and what doesn't. If they want a lot of collective bargaining on everything and they want everybody to have to join a union to work for them, terrific. Fine. I got no problem. But they shouldn't be told. They shouldn't be forced. And uh, um, uh, you can look at what that's what other 29 states do, and that's what the federal government does. There's no reason Illinois can't do that. And that could get a big handle on our cost structure and restore a balance of power between taxpayers and, uh, and the insiders in the government. Same thing on prevailing wage and project labor agreements. In Illinois, basically, taxpayer projects are not allowed to have competitive bidding on them. W wages on construction projects funded by taxpayers get set and, and labor agreements get set by politicians and through the political process. 
Why? And on average, that costs taxpayers 20%, 30% more, sometimes 35% more on every construction project. Why do taxpayers have to pay more just because taxpayers are paying for it? When you remodel your house, would you like it if when you remodeled your kitchen, you were told what you had to pay and who could do the work? No, that's not how, that's not how the economic, that's not how the system in, in America works. Somehow in Illinois, if taxpayers are paying, that's how it works, and that's wrong. And for those governments who want to have prevailing wage and who want to have project labor agreements, keep them. I'm not saying you have to, that you as a local government have to get rid of them, but I want Springfield not telling you what you do. You control it. Think how many more. If, and if we're going to spend, I'd like us to spend tens of billions of dollars on our infrastructure in the coming years. Think how many more schools we could build, classrooms we could upgrade if they cost 25% less. How many more roads could we build and upgrade if they cost 25% less? It's major, major savings for our taxpayers. And how much more money could we save that we could put into our social services if our infrastructure costs 25%? It's a big deal. Same thing on collective bargaining. Um, let's see, what else is there? Uh, let me, I, it's been a long day. Let me make sure I get the, I want to make sure I talk about everything and then get the, uh, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, I believe we should authorize local governments to be able to go bankrupt. It's illegal in Illinois. I don't think that's right. I think that that's, that's unhealthy. Um, that's, we have a bankruptcy code for a reason. Governments should be allowed to use it just like cor uh, business organizations are allowed to use it. It's, it exists for a reason, and it should exist for uh, governments in Illinois. That's part of our reform package. Um, and then the transforming government part, I'd stu I'm going to stay persistent on term limits. I, I believe the term limits are a good thing. Um, the legislature has, has recommended to us that we have 10-year limit, not eight. I'm fine with that. Um, I, I do believe we should merge the, uh, the comptroller and treasurer offices. I've said that all the way through. Um, uh, again, I, I don't believe we should force, uh, we should not force a fair share union dues collection in the government. I've said that, and uh, most states don't allow it, and uh, I'm going to push that as law, not just executive order. I'm pretty confident, I'm highly confident that we'll win the lawsuit uh, that we've got going on about unfair share collection. And we'll get it to the Supreme Court eventually, and I've, I'm pretty sure we'll win. Um, and then I do want to close the special interest loophole. Uh, we've closed the special interest loophole for corporations and individuals who do business with the state. It's illegal in Illinois if you're a business or an individual and you contract with the state, you can't give campaign contributions to elected state officials. That's the law today in Illinois for businesses and individuals. However, we've left it legal for law firms that argue cases in front of judges to give campaign contributions to elect those judges. I think that's a significant problem. It's a conflict of interest. We also have left it legal for government union leaders who contract, who 100% of what they do is contract with the state. Uh, it's, it's perfectly legal for them to give significant campaign contributions to the elected officials that they negotiate contracts with. That's a very major, very fundamental conflict of interest, and I think we should outlaw that. And many other states have outlawed that. So that's, a, that's the summary of our agenda. Uh, it's going to be a rough and tumble legislative process over the next uh, few months. The good news is there are strong Democrats in the state who are leaders who want reform, and there are strong Republicans in the state who want reform, and there's going to be support for the legislators who help, help this sort of reform agenda. I'll turn it over to questions. So you were talking about the uh, uh, your pension reform plan, and you said we could spend years in court before we get that straightened out. But you put two point two billion dollars in savings in your budget proposal based on your pension reform plan. So yeah, <laughs> that doesn't seem to reconcile if you believe you're going to be in court for years and years. Yeah, we think. Well, first of all, I don't know one hundred percent will be in court. But secondly, the the savings are two point seven billion. But we've only budgeted 2.2 to allow for delay and, and issues. And, uh, and uh, it's one of the reasons that we make it as a constitutional referendum, so it's not years and years that we actually get it. I think the odds of the lawsuit um, being a problem go down if people see we're going to, we actually are committed to doing this and we're going to do it in a constitutional referendum. But that's why we did, that's why we budgeted it that way. 
since you've been governor and even before the um, unemployment rate has been coming down and your friend the mayor of Chicago points out that his city is one of those that is like near the top of the list if not at the top for corporate locations so don't you recognize any of this as good news under the current structure look how many jobs we have in Illinois that's the key to look at um, the, the how many job how many jobs jobs has Chicago created how many jobs has the Illinois economy created? That's the key metric, and we're not doing well. And it's, it's, it's nice. It's a good thing that Chicago has been able to attract um, some corporate headquarters. That's a plus. But, you know, getting 100 people uh, to rent some space downtown, that's good. But what we need are lots of small and mid-sized businesses employing thousands of people on the south side and the west side, and that's not happening. Okay. You are going to be meeting... Uh shortly with uh, our mayor-elect and members of our city council and some aldermen-elect. Um, you know, they're very worried that your budget cuts, uh, it's, I think it's between four and five million dollars from what is their, like, I don't know, hundred million dollar budget, uh, which is a significant cut. And so they're probably going to, if you talk business, argue against that. So, and then you want to cap property taxes, which means that you're just squeezing local governments and they've all cut employees just like the state has. So how can you justify you know, putting that kind of pressure on them. Yeah, that's a good time. question. So I've, and that's been the number one topic. That's why I'm meeting with the mayor. I've been meeting with mayors and city councils for, you know, a long time. Um, and I look forward to that discussion. And, and everybody has voiced concern about LGDF cuts, and I get that. And I'll say this, I feel bad about them. Uh, it's not particularly fair. I don't want to balance the budget. On, they didn't create the budget crisis of the state, neither did I. But I also have, <coughs> I have a financial duty to have a balanced budget. And um, we've got and cuts are necessary. Um, what I've said to them is several things, and I will say tonight what I've said to the other mayors. One, I'm going to increase state support for education, starting right now and then significantly in coming years. That doesn't help city government immediately, but it helps relieve local property tax burden, and that over time, local local property taxes don't have to keep going so high there and it can go more to city government. So that's a long-term assistance. Number two, our reform agenda, uh, con local control of collective bargaining loan, uh, and unionization, local control of prevailing wage and project labor agreements, saves huge dollars in city government uh, spending. Huge, huge. And they've all gone, wow, Bruce. And a number of mayors have said to me, Bruce, you deliver those two things for me, I'm not that worried about LGDF. Now, not every mayor has said that. But many have. But that's a big, that's a big item. Uh, and then uh, the additional item is that I say, look, help me get this, LG, uh, this, this uh, turnaround agenda done. This will free up resources the, in the state government. And I'll, I can find ways, I believe, to help restore some of the cuts. I can't promise at what level. Um, and there's going to have to be some cuts. But I, I hold more resources so I won't have to maybe cut so LGDF as much. So that's all part of that message. Are you going to be asking them to support your resolution, backing all the... Sure. Yep. You know, the unions have packed various chambers, and I know you've got, like, East Dundee and Cambridge and, and Macanda who have passed resolutions saying that they're going to do what you want, but in other places, unions continue to be very strong. There's a lot of union support for our new mayor-elect, um, and the biggest rally I've ever seen in Illinois at the State House was thousands of people when Jim Thompson was governor and they were against right to work and he said I'll never sign a right to work including I'm sure he would have said the local and how are you going to you know you say you'll be able to turn that around and you have Democratic allies who are the allies and how are you going to get that done or are you hoping that they rally again so that you you can be Wisconsin I don't know uh, I think I think we have s some uh, bipartisan support. Is there a, a Democratic legislator who will vote for the opportunity for local governments to do right to work zones? Uh, I believe so. Do, can you name them? I think that would be inappropriate right now. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm just saying. It just, you have a Democratic legislature as opposed to these many of these 29 other states you're talking about. They don't. And well, I'm many just, of them do. Okay. Well, and 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 the Democratic Congress passed it for the federal government. I mean, this is not a partisan issue. This is a good government issue. By the way, the Roosevelt Library says that he was not against government unions, but against against uh, strikes by government unions in the federal government. Well, you can, I would just put the yeah. quote out. Yeah, I understood. A question. Um, you can see what Democrats have done. If you look at the federal government law. It was done by Democrats. I have a question. You talk about the government belonging to the people. 
and then uh, another emphasis you talk about is structure. Uh, putting those two things together, how do you create a structure that actually delivers the government to the people of the state in a meaningful way other than just when they vote? You know, where's their power to participate? Where's their power to influence? Where's their power to actually look at the same issues that you've talked about and others to create change? And what's the structure for, in your mind, what's the structure to bring that about? Uh, other than voting? Is that your question is other no, than voting? Yeah, more than voting. I mean, my, what I pick up from what you say and what I've read what you've said is, you know, the government belongs to the people and we all go to vote and that's, that's wonderful that we have that opportunity. Uh, but when you talk about change, it all doesn't come through voting. What other kinds of things do you envision that people can can do to take ownership of government in a more meaningful way and influence things that go on in structural change? Well, I think it happens every day all around the United States. I mean, people come, that's what lobbyists, as much as I criticize and other people criticize lobbyists, they have a role to advocate on particular issues on behalf of particular groups. And, and voters get uh, involved in going to testify at hearings and to meet with their representatives. And it's just part of, the, part of democracy. I'm, I think democracy is occurring every day here and around America. I'm not sure when, I'm not sure I understand your question. I'm not sure well, I can answer. Well, you infer that it isn't working by saying that we need to give the government back to the people. Well, so it, it, here, here's, here's the challenge. If a, if a group that makes its money from the government is concentrated in its power and has strong influence over the elected officials that determine how much money they make from the government, that, that, then that government is not working for the, the, the voters and the taxpayers. It's not working for the people. It's working for the elected official and that power group that's making money from that elected official's decision. That's, that's, the, that's the issue that I'm most concerned about. And that's, that's a big problem in Illinois. Is that limited to public unions, though? No, no, it's not. Cranes reported. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, uh, I mean, so businesses obviously also. Uh, right, and so that's why, so, so we've started the process. We've made it illegal. If you contract with the state, no campaign contributions. We've started. There's more. I think we could restrict more of, of business um, uh, in the process. That's, I, I'm good with that. Where the, the, when you look at where our money's going um, with our pensions and our work rules and our pay scale in, in the government, you can see where the power concentrated power with the elected officials where that's led us and it's a it's a bad it's a bad place Did, uh, with the 26 million dollars that you just cut out of the budget that was already passed for this year including like the autism programs that's getting a lot of publicity in various places our yeah. paper Chicago yeah. indigent funerals that are not being paid for anymore yeah. including representative Brady's funeral home did you break a promise in that and do stories like this give you any pause about the cuts already made and yet to come uh, certainly didn't make it break any promise that I'm aware of. There's no uh, no breaks at all. Um, we are we we passed a bill. We're implementing the bill. Um, and I wasn't I, autism look, services weren't that covered in that bill. Or I mean, to we be? can all. Look, I don't I don't know the specific language we have in the bill on that topic. I don't recall. But we could all look and see. I mean, you could see it. I, we, our team could go find it. We could talk about it. I, I don't, rec I, I can't tell you with these specific words, but I think we're honoring, we're doing what the bill authorizes or what it says. I mean, uh, there are some lawmakers out there who think they were misled by what was told to them before they supported the bill and what's happened now with this additional money that's being frozen. So are they just not understanding what, um, what was in that bill? Were they misled by their leaders or uh, the promises made that are now being broken? Uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. I hope that nobody was misled. I, uh, nobody's been misled that I'm aware of. Um, there, step in real quick. Tim Nooting, the budget director, was up here at the House you know, hearing, the budget hearing, and was very clear on that. We can get you the transcript of that, too, where he talked about that the, the bill itself was not going to be a complete and total fix, that there were going to be other things that we're going to have to do, and I can get you that transcript. Okay. So, but, but I do, you're raising an important point because my this is speculation on my part, but but this may be a little bit too of, of what I've encouraged. I've said, blame me if things are bad. 
it's okay. And, and, and you, you know, and you can avoid, avoid uh, blame yourself and take credit over it. That might be part of it. I don't know. I'm, I'm fine with that. My job is to get things done. And, and I'm going to try to do everything within my heart that's right and to get results. And Are you suggesting this is the case of you, them shifting blame to you? I don't know. Or, I'm not. I, I don't know. I don't know. On taxes, you talked about... Um, you know, not thinking that the wealthy paying more is going to be a good solution. The speaker has talked about, you know, the so-called millionaire's tax. Is that an area that you two just aren't going to be able to agree on? Well, he and I have never discussed that. I've, I've let my position be known that if that, that, um, that's a green light to raise taxes, and, and uh, that's not going to fix our problem, as I pointed out when I talked about this earlier. Do you think he's still going to push for that? I don't know. He hasn't brought it up with me. I don't know. I'm just going to, uh, not based on what the reporting Bernie and Doug said have been doing. I mean, we know the Democrats are going to come to the U and say, or they probably have already, you want this. Here's what we want this in return and way of revenue, taxes, call it whatever you want. Have you begun to form in your mind, okay, here are some taxes or revenue where I'm willing to give a little in return for this. You list, for instance, in your uh, one, two, three, four, five states with a broader s sales tax base than Illinois. Have you begun to form that in your mind? Okay, here, without giving away all of your bargaining chips today. Just <laughs> or if you want to. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll say well, a couple. Fine too. I'll, I'll say a couple things about it. First. Um, I've already said that I'm supportive of tax reform, and I'm certainly open to considering a broadening of the modernizing. Modernizing is a good word for it, of, of the sales tax. I've, already, I've said that on a number of occasions. Um, and, as I, and as I said earlier in our discussion here this, this afternoon, I'm open to considering anything that somebody would like to propose. I'm trying to stay very open-minded. The critical thing is I'm focused on getting this done. Sure. And I'm open-minded on whatever people want to propose. That's part of uh, what this will be. some quick math. Iowa has 87 more taxes on services than Illinois, based on this. Are there, is there a group of them that, well, I could sell this probably? Or? Well, again, I think it's premature to talk about that, that, that sort of level of specificity. That's something we should do with the General Assembly. Um, but I, but I'm, I'm trying to be very clear. I'm open. To, to anything, we've got to get the structural change. Because if we don't get the structural change, we won't have really fixed our long-term financial trouble. Yes, that. taxes for roads. Well, again, our, 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 our gas tax is already pretty darn high. But, but some people are advocating for, for that. I, I, my, focus, my focus is trying to convince people to do this. And if po folks have other ideas, on, on, uh, on, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly going to listen. Certainly so th does this agenda have to be passed before we're going to address any of this other, uh, like infrastructure or uh, tax reform or any of those other issues? Well, it could be two nanoseconds before. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have bills drafted to that effect? Yes. Though? Have they been and introduced? Are they available for public review? N not yet. We will we introduce those when the leaders say we should introduce them. Oh, so you will introduce them at the very end of the session then? When nobody has a chance to review them? Uh, we'll introduce them when the leaders say we should introduce them. I mean, I, you know, the, I don't know when that's going to be. I'm, I'm ready. So, so, so half over. <laughs> you sound like me. <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm, um, you know what? When I first won election, a number of people in the legislature said, hey, Bruce, you know, you got to do a budget in February. You're probably going to need more time. You better, when, how long do you want to delay it? And I said, I don't want to delay it. What date do you need it by? I'll deliver it. I'll deliver it whenever you tell me you're going to deliver it. They say, really? And then they went away. And then a few weeks later, they came back. You're probably going to need more time, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. We're, we're going to always have a balanced budget. We're going to do it on time. And I specifically wanted to do it on time so we have plenty of lead time so everybody can kick the stuff out of me and criticize it. And, and but it's part of the process of give and take. I've been waiting for somebody to come back and say, hey, we, don't, we hate your budget. Here's the budget we think is better. May thirtieth, uh, <laughs> and and uh, and I also said, look, I the way I would have handled the twenty fifteen budget hole, 
I would have said, okay, who's, who are the key folks? Whoever they are, let's get in a room. It'll be fun. We'll get in a room. Let's order some pizza. I, I, I like, I like uh, sausage and, and uh, spinach. And let's, let's talk it through and let's get it done. Because you know what? We're going we're gonna to hurt people if we don't pay for daycare. We're going to hurt people if we don't pay for court. It, well, it doesn't really work that way. I mean, the, you know, they kind of, it's a, it's a process. I don't control it. I've tried to learn. I'm a pretty good student. I've been studying how the, each of the caucus me, leaders work their caucuses. It's a fascinating study in human dynamics. I mean, it's a, the, the level of communication, very different among the four. Uh, the level of control, very different among the four. Um, and you know, I'm trying to. I in my role, I'm trying to. I, I'm trying to be a governor uh, who's effective at working with everybody. I'm, I'm trying to be a good partner. On, on that question of your style, which is laid back today, which is fun and in, in, interesting. But as you have done these editorial boards around the state, the news that has come out is you said that about Indiana, you're one of the baddest <coughs> enemies anybody can have. <laughs> The Supreme Court, you said, is part of the corrupt bargain, and, and the judges, because of lawyers, can donate to them. You've said stuff about New Jersey that made Chris Christie sit up and take notice, even though he was here like eight times to help you in the campaign. And you're going to rip the guts out of Indiana as you – do you trash talk too much? And, or what is, what is the style there? What, what, what's, what, what's sometimes, the sometimes I'm probably – I'm a human being, you know, and sometimes I don't choose my words as, as uh, perfectly as I might, but I'm, you know, I'm a human being. I'm a very passionate person. And I'm fighting for the people of Illinois. A lot of people really thought that maybe you heard some case you want to have in front of the Supreme Court by saying these things about the Supreme Court this week. Do you think that? Uh, uh, I, no, I don't. And, and the Supreme, I'm not, I don't pick a fight. I'm not criticizing any particular court or any particular judge. And, and frankly, I know a couple of the Supreme Court judges personally. I think they're awesome. I have no, it's the system. It's the system that is, has conflicts of interest built into it. And I've talked about various parts of the system. And I'm open, as I've said to other folks, if you disagree with me, if you think it, there's not a conflict, tell me. I mean, I'm, nobody's, nobody's disagreed with me. If you disagree and you think the way that we fund our judges in our elections is fine, I, okay, you should tell, tell me. Nobody said that to me. And I've pointed out, I've stick my neck out because that's my job. I'm stick my neck out to try to make the government work for the people of Illinois. That's all I care about. I think the way that our judges are elected is a problem. I do. It's, and people can disagree if they want. I, nobody. Do you, do you think it would be the sol solving that problem for you to appoint them? Not necessarily. Okay. No, but I, and what, I've, what I have recommended uh, to uh, actually another editorial board that asked the question, I said, let's study what other states do and think about it ourselves. Maybe we can come up with a better way. I don't have a specific recommendation yet. Are you for merit selection then? That's one option I, I would like us to talk about. I think there's pros and cons to that. I think various states have done things in various ways. I think we, I, I'm a big co comparative data benchmarking person. I think we should study what other states do and see what might work better, what, what the options are. Okay. You just signed some uh, money that will go from the EDGE program to support economic growth in the state. Hmm. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Do you have some performance measures to tell us how effective those programs are? Those are being developed. Before the, will we, they be developed before the money is given out? Or well, see, those are those those edge credits were uh, negotiated during the Quinn administration. Some businesses had some understandings of timing and circumstances, and we had a risk of credibility as a state government, um, and, a, and an issue of credibility with the business community on some of these issues. And so we're dealing with them. Same thing happened on the medical marijuana licenses. I wouldn't have done that bill the way it was done. But you know what? I enforce the law, and we, we have a, I have a duty to have it done properly. We try to do it properly. Quinn set it up and ran away from it. I, I, my job, I've just got to de deal the cards I'm dealt to do the best I can. But you will have performance measures that we can yes. look at. And I do want, you have any idea when they might be ready? Uh, boy, I'd like them yesterday. I mean, uh, this, is, this is a big problem uh, for the state. We are not economically competitive, and we haven't been strategic in our business recruiting efforts. And I really want to change that. And that's where I inartfully said I'm going after Indiana. I am going after Indiana. And I'm going after Wisconsin. And I'm going after Iowa and Missouri and Kentucky and China and Germany and the UK. And I'm working for the people of Illinois. And I'm a heck of a great partner. And I'm going to be, I'm going to grow the heck out of our economy because I want incomes rising for our families and I want lots of careers. And what I inartfully say, I'm a bit, you know, 
That's because I'm competitive. I, and I'm working for the people of Illinois, and I'm very passionate about it. That's, that's what that is. Who is developing those measures for you? Which department? Or, or how is that? Well, we've got a new CEO of uh, uh, Decio named Jim Schultz. Uh, he's assembling a team. And we've also got members of the business community advising him. And we're going to look at the possibility of completely revamping and restructuring Decio and, and the incentive programs. And we're trying to think outside the box, and we're trying to study what other states who are succeeding on their economic development, what they're doing and how they're doing it, and try to dramatically improve our, our process. Two minutes. Uh, where are you on the pairs of the mansion since we're here? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, uh, uh, Diana and the, the board have been meeting. I think they've been talking to architectural firms and contractor firms. Um, uh, boy, it couldn't happen soon enough for me, but I, I'm really not too involved in the detail of the process. Um, I think we're going to start with the roof major. It's, there's some pretty major structural things that really need to be fixed, and it's many millions of dollars. Um, I hope uh, Dina thinks that we're going to have to move out for a while because of all the stuff that we got to do in the dust, and I think there's some asbestos issues and whatnot. So, I, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, the, the sooner it happens, the better. But it's it's going pretty slow. And I actually, for me, it's fine. I mean, I I it's perfectly fine. But but it it really does need it needs work. And and I'm just worried that the structure itself will begin to really to badly deteriorate if we don't take some pretty major. What about the funding? Are you seeking private donations? Yes, How you plan? private, yeah. Former Congressman Aaron Schucks, former Chief of Staff, was convinced you funded ads against him a year ago, which perhaps precipitated. Did you do any of that? And any thoughts on Schock and the uh, replacement? No, as system? I said before, I absolutely did not. Thoughts on, I'm sorry, what was your Oh, saying? just Schock's downfall and, and you know, what... Well, I think it's a tragedy. I think it's a very sad, as I said, it's a very, uh, the whole situation. Are you backing uh, Senator LaHood or do you have a, hor a horse? I've encouraged address? Darren to run. I like Darren. I know him well. Uh, I think he'd be a great congressman. I've encouraged him. Okay. And can you say anything? Uh, there's just a big looming story. Universities facing 31% cuts. I think you said here during the primary race when you <coughs> visited that uh, teacher tenure at colleges may be something that you'd question. You care think you will carry through with 31% cuts to universities because obviously you're hearing reports of the devastation that will cause on the various campuses? Well, with again, without reform, um, we're going to have to make painful cuts. Uh, with reform, I think we'll free up resources. And again, I'm open to all kinds of considerations, and we'll talk about it, but we've got to get the reform. One of my most, uh, I, I am very committed to uh, high quality education from birth to through age 40. And I want great universities, state universities. Our, univer our tuition's too high, our enrollment's too low, um, our quality is mixed. And, and one of the most troubling things that I've got to somehow get, get us to get a handle on is the overhead cost, the bureaucracy cost in our universities is stunningly high. Yeah, there was just there, a recent article in the New York Times Sunday that spoke to the growth in the cost of education in, in public colleges and universities. Yes. And it's it's not necessarily factors, uh, you know, faculty salaries. It's, it's the that's expansion right. of administrative infrastructure within the system that has pushed those exactly. sky high. And I hope that when you look at that, you'll look at that as a real critical variable. I yeah. <laughs> that was my I, I couldn't have said it better. What, what you did. I've been saying it for a long time. It's a big problem. My personal goal is to get the money and more money into the classroom with the teachers, the professors, and the students, not in the bureaucracy. And, and our university system is a microcosm of our state government. Hugely expensive pensions, hugely expensive health care, hugely expensive salaries, um, unworkable work rules, and, and, a, and a massive bureaucracy that's consuming the resources that should be going to the education. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Um,